Okay, it's time to get started. Welcome everybody to the Musella Foundation's Brain Tumor Awareness Month webinar series. Tonight's topic is the promise of immunotherapy and glioblastoma, and our special guest speaker is Dr. Daniela Boda. She's a Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Research, the Chief Scientific Officer for UCI Center for Clinical Research. She's also the Medical Director of the Comprehensive Brain Tumor Program at the University of California, Irvine. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Al, for inviting me to talk tonight with our colleagues and with our patients. It is my great pleasure to have this opportunity. And for everybody that's joining us online, thank you for spending their Sunday evening being with us. What I would like to talk to you tonight is the promise, both the one that's taking place and the one that we hoped and dreamed on, of immunotherapy in glioblastoma. I would start with the fact that my basic and clinical research has been supported by many foundations and federal and state agencies. And I continue to work with a number of companies that are trying to develop medications for glioblastoma. I'm not going to spend too much time telling everybody what is glioblastoma. We already know, we see it every day. Glioblastoma, it's a very common, very aggressive brain cancer. It is a rare tumor, fortunately, and the tumor size can double every two weeks when the tumor is not appropriately treated. I've been in a field for almost 20 years, and during the last 20 years, we have had great promises and great medications being approved. In 2005, we had the approval for temozolomide. In 2009, we have the approval for Avastin. And both in 2011 and 2016, we had approvals for Novocure or Optune. However, now in 2020, we are four years out of having a new approval, and we all are looking forward to the hope of immunotherapy making a difference in the field of glioblastoma. So why do we need a medication or an approach that will make a difference? Because in spite of all the work that we have done through the years, the medium survival of patients with glioblastoma has not overcome the limit of two years. And in the community, many times the number is 12 to 15 months. This is because putting all the treatments that we have together, we still cannot stop for many cases the tumor from progressing and causing deficits, disability, and death. So this is where we open the story of why to research immunotherapy. And what you see in the left side of the panel, it's our history with a glioblastoma therapy, one of the first immunotherapies called Ridopepimod. And this is a study that was done many years ago, seven, eight years ago, and it compared recurrent patients with glioblastoma in a randomized manner, was half of the patients getting bevacizumab and the other half of the patients getting bevacizumab plus rindopepimod. If you look at this graph, what you see, it's a classical tail. We had a number of the patients that were treated with the combination doing better and having long-time survival as compared with the patients that are receiving Avastin alone. But more important and more significant for me is the fact that this is my patient and him is now an eight year survival with glioblastoma and still going strong. And maybe this study didn't help everybody. Unfortunately, we don't know what are the patients that can be fully helped and why some people live so long and some other people don't. But this is giving us a message that eight-year survival with glioblastoma is possible in the world and time of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is not unique for glioblastoma. The cancer immunotherapy is the next frontier. A Nobel Prize was awarded in 2018 to two scientists for the discovery of cancer therapy by trying to inhibit the immunosuppression seen many times in cancer. This is a topic that's near and dear to my game. This is uh, an editorial that was written about my work in the local journal. 
the Orange County Register, and the date is 2012. And this is how long some of the work that I've been involved on creating vaccines has been going, and we still continue to make slow by steady progress. And if you'll ask, why slow by steady? There are a number of cancers now that are greatly benefiting from having those drugs that can stop tumor-caused immune inhibition and can stimulate the immune response to fight their tumors. We hear stories of melanoma, of lung cancer, of bladder cancer. And the reason it's much more complex, the reason is that the brain tumors have their certain biology, which is related to the normal brain biology, that wants to limit the possibility of the immune system fully attacking the tumor and creating brain swelling and possible jeopardizing the patient's life. So the current augmentarium that we are studying right now is composed of checkpoint inhibitors, vaccines, and I'll spend a little bit of time on vaccines, viral therapies, and the new kid on the block, the CAR-T therapies. So now when we want to take them one by one, I would start with one of those drugs, the checkpoint inhibitors, the drugs that are validated in other cancers. And the, I will ask the question, why not to use it in glioblastoma? And what you see here from one of the scientific articles in the field, it's a series of two patients. Both patients had a tumor, a recurrent tumor. And this tumor, as you could see, was very well controlled by the addition of nivolumab, which, which is again, one of the checkpoint inhibitors. And here you see another patient that again had a glioblastoma. Both of those patients here had glioblastomas. And you can see them being stabilized by nivolumab was actually excellent responses. So what was different for those two patients that maybe is not the same for all the other patients that we treat? Those patients were siblings, their brother and sister, their children, one was four, the other is seven years of age. And they had a collection of multiple mutations and genetic syndromes that make their tumors very immunogenic. And it made easier for the immune system once released from in its inhibition to target and attack the tumor. And this is showing about how abnormal those tumors are, how they have mutations on almost each gene that controls DNA repair. And this is why they are able to respond beautifully to treatment. How unique are those cases? Unfortunately, those cases are pretty unique. We are calling them hypermutant glioblastomas. And if we look at the number of mutations, the way in which we can stimulate the immune response, those tumors are really, really high. But if we look at our regular patients coming in the clinic with pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastomas, all kinds of other tumors, including the glioblastoma, what we see is that their ability to raise an immune response, it's much, much lower. Actually, this is so low that the brain tumors are called cold tumors. And here I want you to see what tumors are very hot, have a very high frequency of molecules on the surface of the cell that signal, I'm a tumor, I'm a tumor, for the immune system to come and attack them. And this is the lung and the melanoma, as we were discussing before. If, again, we look at the tumors of the brain, we can see that with some small exceptions, which we are all, always testing and trying to identify, majority of our tumors are on the level that only occasionally will express the signals that will make them discovered by the immune system. So then what else can we do to try to activate immunity and get our own immunity to be able to fight the tumor? So the first trial that was done that I want to talk about, try to use the drugs, try to use nivolumab 
in recurrent patients and compare it to the standard of care, which is Bevacizumab. Unfortunately, this study, which was initially reported in 2017 and published just days ago, showed the nivolumab, the drug that will activate the immune system, was not able to improve the patient's survival as compared with the standard of care drug. A newly diagnosed study was also conducted, and again, on the nivolumab drug, Optivo, which is many approved for many other malignancies, many other cancers, but in glioblastoma, even in combination with radiation and chemotherapy, the nivolumab was not able to impact survival. So those were kind of somber data for us, but also suggested there may be other things that we need to take in consideration when we want to design new treatments for glioblastoma. And to make us a little bit more hopeful, this is the study from Dr. Clausy, our colleague at UCLA, in combination with scientists from Dana-Farber and other clinical centers. And this study did something slightly different. The study gave pembrolizumab or Keytruda, which is another type of inhibitor, PD-1 inhibitor, checkpoint inhibitor, but they gave the drug before and after surgery for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. Why is this a difference? It is a difference because during the surgery, when the tumor is cut and break into pieces to be extracted from the patient's brain, also antigens, little pieces from the tumor, are released into the circulation where they can come directly in contact with our immune system and activate our immune system. And you could see that in this small study, the patients that had the treatment was the checkpoint inhibitor, was the Keytruda before and after surgery, their survival was significantly larger, 417 days, versus the patients that did not get the same treatment, they just got standard of care treatment, and their survival was 230 days. Again, unfortunately, this treatment didn't help all the patients, but here is the example of the patient that was highly helped by this medication, and you could see that the patient at the time of publication was alive for almost two years. So food for our thoughts. The other part for food for our thoughts, and we're gonna to continue to discuss this maybe more in the future, is that the MRI doesn't give us many times a good representation if the tumor is growing or not growing because the immune response also creates inflammation in the brain that can look just like the tumor. And in reality, we need to develop therapies and drugs that prolong the patient's survival because we are treating the patient, we are not treating the MRI. And this is a good lesson for us and a new request from the FDA when we build our studies in the immunotherapy era. So let's talk a little bit, how can we overcome the local and the systemic blockage on the immune response that is induced by glioblastoma? We know that this is a multifactorial system, not only the problems that we have in the tumor in the brain, but also our patients many times have temodar before temozolomide before we start immunotherapy, which induces lymphopenia. We also sometimes create problems in the bone marrow, in the spleen, and in the lymph nodes. And some of them are created by treatment, but many of them are created by the cytokines, by the substances that are released from the brain tumor. So with that in mind, two approaches were developed. One approach is the glioma vaccine. Basically, and I will show you a few examples of glioma vaccines, the idea is the same as we are trying to use when we try to prevent viral infections, a subject, unfortunately, that we all are getting more and more knowledge at this time. So what you will do in this process, you will take a piece of the tumor, the patient's own tumor, or you'll take some of the proteins from the patient's tumor, 
which will make the approach more, more generic, but more easier to administer. And then you'll inactivate the tumor cells, you radiate them or break them, make sure that they cannot form tumors in any way, size or shape. And then you'll administer them to the patient in order to stimulate the patient recognition, immune system recognition of the tumor antigens. Another approach is the viral therapy on which viruses are injected during surgery on the residual tumor. The viruses go on in the tumor cells, infect the tumor cells and break the tumor cells, which are now released in the blood circulation in such a way that the immune system now can recognize them and come then back into the tumor and destroy more of the tumor cells. So when we talk about the vaccines, just in a simple way, there are a few types of vaccines. The first one is what I was trying to describe in the beginning. It's a vaccine that is produced on against one peptide or one protein of the patient's tumor or a very limited set of proteins, five or six. The advantage of those vaccines is that they're off the shelf. You don't need to take the patient's tumor and make it into a vaccine. You just need to confirm that the vaccine that you have, it's against a protein that it's already expressed on the patient's tumor. And the qualification will be strictly looking at even a biopsy sample and making sure if the patient qualifies or doesn't qualify because he or she has or doesn't have the target for your vaccine. The dendritic cell vaccines are almost at the other end of being personalized. In those type of treatments, and I'll show you a few descriptions of them, the DCVAX and the IVITA, the patient's tumor is removed surgically and then immune cells are removed from the patient's blood. Both of those components are then multiplied in the lab. The tumor is inactivated and separated in many, many antigens. The patient's immune cells are subjected to recognizing the antigen in the dish and then repurified and administered to the patient, same patients to boost the immune response. The last part of the list, which is kind of a mix between those two, it's a whole cell tumor lysate vaccine where the tumor is extracted, it's made into a, a vaccine, inactivated, stimulated for immune response and injected under the patient's skin close to the lymph nodes. And the idea is that if you are very close to the lymph nodes where our immune cells are made, maybe you don't need to take the immune cells out of the patient's blood. The stimulation of the immune system can happen in the patient's body. So I will talk first about the peptide vaccine that I started my story with James and his eight year survival. And the vaccine that was developed 10 to 12 years ago at Duke was based on the fact that many of the brain tumors, many of the gliomas express an abnormal protein, which is called EGFR V3. What this protein makes is that it makes tumor cells grow faster and faster, and many of those tumors are resistant to treatment. This protein is not present on all the glioblastoma patients, it's present only on 30% of the patients that we have tested. So now I'm going back to the study that I showed you before, the study where my patient did very well, so many other patients did quite well. And what you could see on the side of the slide, it's basically a pre-vaccine and post-vaccine effort. And pre-vaccine, you could see that the cells are having this protein, the EGFRV3, it's the brown sign. And you could see that unfortunately the tumor still recurred. That's why we have a second surgery here. And when the tumor recurred, what happened is that the cells that are positive for this protein were removed, while the other sets of cells continue to divide. So what we are learning is that yes, we can very effectively remove one set of cells, but can we remove all the cancer sets of cells? 
So this is where the dendritic cell vaccines are coming, because when you take the whole tumor, you extract theoretically all the antigens that are present in the tumor at that given time. With that, you can create a lysate that will be very comprehensive for that point in time. You also have in, to extract the immune cells, which we call the dendritic cells, and isolate them, mature them, and through an extensive process, create powerful dendritic cells that now can recognize the tumor. Those cells are getting frozen in aliquots and they are administered for this study, which is the DCVAX led by Dr. Linda Liao from UCLA in 11 treatment cycles. So what were the results of this study? This was a very, very large study and something that I think it's important for you guys to know is that out of the patients that we started with, only 300 of them ended up being actually on the study. And what was the reason? The reason mostly was this process is long and laborious. And many times for this version of the vaccine, we needed large amounts of tumor lysate. Just as a note, I do see that we have questions on the chat. Is it okay, Al, that we take them at the end of the presentation? Yes, we're going to do all the questions at the end. Very good. So if we look at the patients that actually did go on the study, what we see on the first results that we published together, we are part of this study as well at the University of California, Irvine, that Again, we might not have helped every patient, but in this study, 30% of the patients that received the vaccine lived four years. And 24% of them, if you look at the numbers, lived more than seven years. So if you think of the number that we started with, you could see that this is a significant improvement and we are still waiting for Northwest Biotherapeutics, the company that owns this vaccine, to go with the full set of data for FDA evaluation. And I really hope that they're gonna be very successful. The next vaccine that I want to talk to you about, it's a vaccine that we are developing here in Irvine in collaboration between the university and a company, stem cell company called Ivita. My interest and my basic research deals with glioblastoma stem cells. The glioblastoma stem cells are the most resistant to treatment cells in the tumor. They are also the mother cells that keep producing the daughter cells so the tumor continues to repopulate and regrow. So what is different in this dendritic cell study as compared to the one that I showed you before is that the cells are collected, the tumor cells are collected, but instead of using the whole tumor, which might contain blood, blood vessels, normal neurons, necrotic cells, we are processing the cancer stem cell to a specific grow method. And then on those cultures, we start subjecting the cancer stem cells to the regular treatments that they will be subjected in the patient treatment, like radiation, chemotherapy, lysis, and in the end, we end up with a mix of antigens that are presenting to the dendritic cells. And then the dendritic cells are administered back to the patient, those are newly diagnosed patients, to get those the standard of care post-radiation temozolomide. So those are early data. We have finished enrolling 60 patients. We will have data to present at the Society of Neuro-Oncology meeting. But our preliminary data show a 76% survival at 15 months, which is very favorable and hopefully compare with the published data in the original study that validated the use of Temadar, which gave that not even half of the patients were able to go over 15 months. So time will tell if this is a more successful approach. We really hope so, and we're going to keep the community informed. Now, the one which Al and I have met, we have met initially discussing about this product, the ERC1671 or Gliovac. 
And this is a vaccine that I have been working on for about 10 years together with a European company, ERC Belgium. And what this vaccine does goes into the idea of how can we overcome the possibility that if we take a tumor now and we vaccinate to the antigens that the tumor has, the tumor is going to develop new cells that are going to become resistant to my immune therapy because the immune system is not going to recognize them. That process is called immune escape. So what this study does, it's besides the tumor glioblastoma lysate, it also administers three lysates from three different other patients with glioblastoma, donor patients, in the hope that we are now enlarging the set of antigens and we can prevent the immune escape. In a way, it's very similar with the flu shot, which is not against one virus, but it's against multiple, multiple strains of viruses trying to prevent the flu from becoming more deadly or escaping immune recognition. Those are our data that were recently published and they are now going to evaluation by the European community because there is our hope that this treatment is going to be initially uh, accepted on a temporary base in Europe. And what I want to show you here, those are recurrent patients. When the disease is recurrent, the medium survival is seven months. Our patients, half of them went over 12 months and this compares very favorable, if you look at the numbers here, with any current published study in glioblastoma using the standard of care of Aste. So we are very hopeful that this treatment is going to make a difference. What is also important to note about this treatment is that we were able to be the first center in the United States to offer this treatment in the right to try program, allowing patients that had not qualified for the clinical trial to have access to this potentially helpful vaccine. So I'm gonna close with the early tumor targeting. As we know, any time that we do surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, there is a risk of recurrence and 80% of those recurrences will be around the tumor cavity where the surgery was done. And only 20% will be a remote distance where the cancer clone traveled through the brain and develop a tumor at the other side. So this was the idea for which Tocagen and Toca FC were developed, it was a very exciting idea for us at that time. And we were hoping that by injecting viruses in the tumor, in the residual tumor, the virus will destroy the cells. The cells will be released now in the circulation. The immune system will be primed and will come to aggressively clean up the virus mixed with the cells. So, to add to that, the TOCA system also created a gene that was an, that when chemotherapy was administered in combination to this gene viral vector, were able to make the chemotherapy more effective in the brain. The phase one data were quite promising. You could see here that overall survival at 12 months was going over 60% on recurrent patients, much better than what is the CCNU treatment. And we have all embarked as a system of investigators and institutions together to try to validate this treatment. Unfortunately, like many of our ideas, and this is a pathway that we have taken many times and we are learning from doing it every time, the results of the phase three study were, recurrent, were negative. And the Therapy is now bought by another company and hopefully we'll be able to study it in combination with other immune targeted agents. I want to close with the CAR T's as this is the new buzz in glioblastoma treatment. The advantages of the CAR T treatments as early concepts is that those are T cells derived from every patient and they can go into the brain, they can go through the blood brain barrier. The difficulties that we have is that, as I showed you in the beginning, with 
the peptide vaccine against one antigen that it worked only for a minority of the patients. The CAR T's that we have right now in glioblastoma are an early generation CAR T's that are targeted to a single antigen. Also, we have to keep in mind that the current CAR T technology has a risk of neurological toxicity like seizures and strokes and encephalitis, which is not insignificant and which border 30 to 50% of the patients. And the manufacturing of the cell is very complicated because you need to genetically engineer them in order to be able to recognize the antigen that you target them through. This is the only result that I can present for you on a targeted CAR T treatment. This was produced by City of Hope. This is the treatment of the patient that had a positive protein that you can see here, very large name. And on CAR T cells are produced against that protein, what you can see here is that this patient had originally a large tumor and then an excellent response to the CAR T treatment. When the patient recurred, the patient responded again to the same treatment, which is very, very hopeful. So why wouldn't we do this for each and every patient? The reason for which we can't do this for each and every patient is that this patient was very unique, like the children that I started with. He had this gene, this protein, this mutated protein in each and every of his cells, 100%, which is a very, very rare event. So what is our future? We need to start studying combinations. The checkpoint inhibitors, was vaccines, was oncolytic viruses. We also have to learn who responds to which treatment and be able to personalize our treatment so the right patients get the targeted treatment that's right for them. And with the CAR T therapy, I'm very encouraged by the fact that right now, multiple epitopes are developed. So instead of having a CAR T attacking one type of protein, we can now produce and manufacture CAR T's on other cancers that can go for multiple proteins that are normally expressed on each patient's tumor, making treatments that are both patient specific and very powerful. So with that, I want to introduce you and to thank my teams at UCI from medical neuro-oncology, surgical neuro-oncology and our clinical research personnel and most important to remind you the reason for which we are all going to do this work and this science every day, my wonderful patients. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. That was very informative. You did a fantastic job. Uh, there's a bunch of questions. First, um, I can't understand how the rinder peppermint could fail in a phase three after it did so good in early trials. Do you have any ideas what might have caused it to fail and is it still worth looking at for future with combinations? So the rindapapimod actually did fail in newly diagnosed patients. It did not fail on recurrent patients. It's just that the company lost interest on developing it in recurrent patients. If we go back to those data, there was a survival advantage for the patients getting the combination. But because uh, it didn't work in newly diagnosed, it wasn't further developed. So the first idea here is how can we find as a community the way of studying treatment when drug companies lose interest? Okay. Um, and in general, I hate to say, but there's a lot of examples where the phase two trials do well and the phase threes do bad. What could possibly cause that? Are they designed differently? Or was it just luck or... What happens? No, I think that I can give a good answer to that, Al, and it's based on how the phase three studies are conducted. So when we conduct phase twos at my center, at other centers, we have great attention to details. We're experienced investigators. We have done this for many, many years. If it's a multi-center, it's a small number of centers, all of us being trained and taught the same way. 
When you go on the phase three studies, you need hundreds of centers. And many times the standard of practice and experience is not the same. But there's not something wrong because when you develop a treatment, your hope is that then we're gonna be accepted by the world in general, by the whole community. And the level of expertise is going to be different because not everybody has the ability to access a major neuro-oncology program. So that's the difference from the prototype and the real world taking your car to drive through, you know, the yes. crazy streets of Los Angeles. Okay. Um, how does steroids affect the response to uh, these immunotherapies, specifically your vaccines? Excellent question. So the data that we have, including from checkpoint inhibitors to the vaccines to viral treatments, all of them prove that if high doses of steroids are given, we have a decrease in the number of T lymphocytes. And with the decrease on the number of T lymphocytes, which are the cells that attack the tumor, we see a reduced efficacy to the level that in general, doses over four milligrams of dexamethasone every day exclude the patients from many of those clinical trials because we know they don't have any benefit. In my practice, in our practice at UCI, we always try to reduce the steroid dose as much as we can and as fast as we can. Okay, would it make sense to start the vaccines early, way before starting the temozolomide, for the same reason? So yes, and the dendritic cell vaccines, both of them, I didn't go into whole details, they are started before the temozolomide. So at least the first three vaccines, first three shots were given before temozolomide is started. For the IVTA, that is, for the ERC1671, for the Gliovac, which is a recurrent disease uh, study, the reason on which we deal with the steroids is that we start the vaccine at the same time that we start the Avastin. And the Avastin usually allows us to taper the steroids very fast because it has a great effect on brain edema. Okay, you showed a slide uh, with Gliovac uh, and you compared it to how the results were with Optune. Have you ever combined the two with the Gliovac and Optune? Not yet. The clinical trial is a double-blinded placebo-controlled study with the crossover, and it was done before Optune has become uh, approved for recurrent glioblastoma. I also want to remind you that Optune for recurrent glioblastoma is approved as single agent. So we wouldn't be able to give it in combination with the Vastin and the Gliovac. The only way that we could do that is having uh, the company that makes up to Novocure offering our patients the device for free and not through the insurance. Mm. There was two presentations at ASCO about Optune, one with using stereotactic radio surgery and Optune that looked really good. And then another one with uh, Avastin and Optune that looked really good. So I would imagine that the Avastin, Optune, and the vaccine might even do better. We got to talk to them. I am a great believer in the data for Optune. We use them in newly diagnosed studies all the time because in newly diagnosed studies that it's an approval and definitely based on what's going to happen in Europe, if we're going to have um, an approval, then we will be able to power through using the Optune at the recurrent time. Okay. Has the COVID-19 epidemic affected your clinical trials? Very little. At UCI, we have continued all the clinical trials. What we have changed was how we conducted the clinical trials. So we have increased the number of telemedicine visits. We have done a lot of the evaluation remote. We have discussed MRIs remotely. We do have a very strong telemedicine program in neuro-oncology, but we continued because we know cancer cannot wait. Based on national data, however, I, I'm aware that only 30% of the cancer studies continued during the pandemic. So many patients were affected. Yes, here in the Northeast, a lot of them shut down. It was bad here. Um, I love the concept of the ICT-107. Are there any thoughts of making 
a vaccine like ICT-107, but customized based on a patient's individual test? So this is what I was trying to tell to you about uh, the CAR-T against multiple antigens. Right. So basically it's the same idea. There were vaccines that were tried against the new antigen epitopes. Uh, one of them was going, the study was going at Dana-Farber. I have not yet seen published results on that study, but I'm looking forward to see if an update is given at SNOW. In my opinion, that would be very successful, but the question is how many antigens can you synthetically produce? You can, ICT-107 had six and it has failed. Would the right number be eight, 10, 20? What does it become uh, unfeasible from a production point of view? I'm thinking if it was six, but targeted specifically to that patient, it might actually help. Um, because some of those obviously, some of the patients didn't have all those six targets. Yeah. Um, we're actually having the people from City of Hope for next week's webinar, and they'll be talking about the CAR T cells. Wonderful. Um, I might log in to get a better glimpse of their activity, though we work very closely together. We are just a few miles away. Okay. And you mentioned the uh, vaccines being similar to the antiviral stuff for COVID-19. One of the things they're trying now is they're taking blood from patients who beat COVID-19 and injecting it into patients, uh, figuring out the antibodies should help the patient. Could the same type of thing happen with glioblastoma? Get somebody who's a longtime survivor of glioblastoma and see if they have antibodies? Uh, glioblastoma, as compared with the virus, uh, need a different type of immune uh, system activation. So attacking the viruses usually need an activation of the B cells, which produce uh, the antibodies against the virus. In the glioblastoma, we need both B cell and T cell activation, and the T cell activation will not be produced, will be not transferable from one patient to the other. You, what you will need is the antigens from the tumor to be presented. Okay, that's a good answer. Not good for us, but the answer. In the body, when you inject a vaccine, like all these DC vaccine, vaccines, that's a shot in the arm, correct? It is a shot in the arm, it's physically, or in the leg, it's physically oh. a vaccine. The same okay. as you get a small flu shot with a small needle. The side effects on all those vaccines are none or very little. Okay, um, you mentioned that the ERC-1671 vaccine is available on right to try. Uh, is, is it still available? Yes. How about your DCATA vaccine? Is uh, that only trials or is it on compassionate use or right to try? Uh, this, that vaccine, so again, the right to try compassionate use programs are administered by the companies. So to my knowledge, both have different ways to access the treatments outside of clinical trials, but that will go through a direct contact to the company. Okay, and for your trial of the DC ATA, what exact patient are you looking for? What qualifications? Right now we have closed enrollment. Oh. So we are waiting for the data to mature. That's why I said I'll be able to show new data at SNOW. And when we open a larger phase three study, probably what we're gonna be looking at again is newly diagnosed patients that need to have surgery in one of the participating centers so we can extract the tumor. That was going to be the next question. If a patient wanted to try one of these vaccines under the right to try, and they have surgery at a certain place, how do you have to store the tumor to get it to like the ERC people? Is it just a standard frozen, like no. a normal way? They will have to contact the company before they have surgery. And the company will send a vial with media, special tumor grow media. If the tissue is frozen, the cells are killed and okay. the proteins are degraded. So this has to, the arrangements have to be done before the surgery. Okay, so they can't just go back if they had it stored. No, unfortunately, no. Many people ask me that and I wish it would be possible, but not at this time. Yeah, the DC Vax people allowed that. They said if it was stored in the, if it was frozen in the correct way, they could use it to make a vaccine if, if DC Vax ever gets approved. Again, and it's the same story. If it's frozen in a correct way, meaning that to my knowledge, DC Vax also wants to send their own kit. Okay. To have the tumor process in their own way. 
Um, you didn't mention the vaccine Cervaxam. Have you, do you know anything about Cervaxam? Yes, I didn't mention it here because again, they are promising data, but I haven't seen um, the final results. I'm waiting like with all the other vaccines to see, can we go on the phase three and how is the phase three going to look like? Okay, I'm just looking at, we have this being broadcast in 10 different spots. So I'm looking for questions everywhere. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Would it make sense to combine vaccines? Like I know some of these, you know, there's a few different ones like the um, rhino peppermint and then you have the DC vax type of vaccines. Would it make sense to combine these or no? I think that we have to learn more about the safety of combining vaccines because until now the reason for which those vaccines are very safe is because we're not able to raise a very very strong immune response that can create brain inflammation we are getting now case reports about different some of the combination early combinations between uh, off-label therapies and radiation and uh, checkpoint uh, inhibitors where patients are starting to develop encephalitis, brain inflammation. Right. So I recommend against doing this outside of a clinical trial where the safety is very carefully studied. Okay, with these tumor lysate vaccines, is it possible to get a uh, autoimmune type of response? We have not seen it and I have treated probably close to 50 patients now. Oh, good. Um, somebody asked about the German company Seagat and their vaccine. Is that related to the one you just talked about, ERC? I'm not aware of this company. I have to apologize. I'm not sure what is that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of them. Exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's an exciting time. Um, we're, my organization is actually working on a bill in Congress right now that will ask the FDA to create a new pathway to approval for drugs like this where we get a very early approval so we could combine them as needed instead of having to wait until they're approved to uh, start these combinations. And we take drugs like the Rinda Peppermint, where by itself is not really working, but it's safe and it has helped some people approve it so that people can use it in combinations in the future. I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> Al, it's amazing. Please let me know if you need a letter. As soon. <laughs> We believe on trying all the combinations we can. My only caveat is that let's try them in a way that we learn and it's safe for our patients. Oh, it would be uh, a requirement that every single patient would have to be followed in a registry so that okay. we learn by everybody. Uh, this looks like the last question. It's a question about DC Vax. Uh, with the data that you just showed, that was a combination of people in the treatment group and the control group even though most of the people in control group crossed over, right? So this is, yes, that's very correct. And I did not give you more time to talk about very similar we have seen on the ERC1671. What we are learning is that if you are exposed to the vaccine, it really didn't matter on the DFC vax, and now we are seeing it on the ERC, if you got it from the beginning or you got it at the time of crossover, you still ended up doing very, very well as compared with the people that didn't cross or the other people that were treated on standard of care therapies on other studies. Right, but is it possible that the small number of people who do not get DC Vax could actually have done so well that it makes the study fail or is that not possible? Not possible, not that I know of. Of course, we are waiting for the company to prepare the final data. What I'm basing this on is the groups that we have on the Optune study, the Stupo Optune study. Mm -hmm. And if we'll compare with that, at least visually, again, I have not done the statistics, the data are not uh, public uh, available, just the minimum amount of data that I already presented to you. But just kind of looking at them in comparison, the Optune study, the medium overall survival was two years. And now here we are seeing, and you know, and the tail of people going off over five years was about 15%. That's wild. In that's that's impressive. That we just looked at, they look more favorable. Yes. Um, let me see. I think that was the last question. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much. And I just want to say that next week's uh, 
webinar is going to be on Fighting GBMs by Christopher Duma. He's the director of the Brain Tour program at Hogue, uh, Hogue Memorial Hospital in Newport Beach, California. He'll be talking about leading edge radio surgery and their CAR T cell program and other immunotherapies. Thank you, Dr. Boda. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. Bye. Bye bye.